what I think is easy to take for granted in the United States, where, you know, the individual, um, mm. the kind of one's individuality as expressed through a number of, you know, visual choices, your home, your clothing, um, your vehicle, you know, all of that was, um, it, it, you know, th this just, we, we don't question it. It's, 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 uh, it's an idea that is so ingrained in the kind of the idea of choice and um, finding one's identity through those choices. I think this was largely absent in the Soviet Union. Of course, there were elites and people that had access to things that other people didn't. But for the most part, the idea that you know one defines themselves through the collective as opposed to the individual. Um, was very much, you know, uh, served up as a kind of truth and something to aspire to. That's fascinating. Um, um, so the... I, I graduated and, um, you know, I spent a few years struggling, doing various kinds of work, um, trying to continue to take pictures seriously. And I think maybe slowly realizing that um, I had other attractions, like color was one of them, but, you know, I was not taught that in any kind of formal way. I barely looked at any pictures. I remember, I guess it's now 20 years, but... Um, I saw somehow online um, images from Sleeping by the Mississippi, you know, Alex Soth's book, it just came out. And there was something in those pictures that felt like I, I saw a new way of thinking. And, you know, I read a little bit about it. I sort of then went back and looked at the references. So this was the first, through Alex Soth, I was like, oh, Stephen Shore. Oh, you know, Joel Sternfeld. Um, it was, I mean, it was that, it's, it's almost embarrassing to admit. So all of a sudden there was this whole new way of thinking about um, the landscape that felt really interesting to me. Um, so I, uh, at the time I received a grant to go, and I initially proposed to spend time in the kind of Arctic North and photograph there, uh, I tried, it was so brutal. And so I kind of abandoned that idea and um, started making these very quiet landscapes. Um, again, I didn't know exactly what I was after. The project is called Remains. Um, but it was, you know, I think students are really anxious about not knowing what they're doing. It feels bad. And I remember it felt bad. It felt bad to not have uh, a kind of path laid out. But uh, at the same time, I think my ability to kind of enter a place like this was a bus station in Ukraine, in Sevastopol, um, which is uh, in Crimea. And I, you know, was sort of just happened on its own. I went to use the bathroom uh, and then I saw the scene by the bathroom and I remember being really excited. Uh, I knew that there was something here that felt important. And part of it was this bizarre, it, it, it's almost like a museum to a kind of past, but a, you know, not a past that was totally pushed off to the side. So the Lenin statue there, it's a kind of strange statue. It's cut off in this awkward place, standing next to what it looks like a kind of carefully arranged um, set of furniture. It's a municipal space, but it feels like it's being made to look intimate. Uh, and all of that in a kind of metaphorical way spoke to me about the process of, um, you know, this the kind of former Soviet countries disentangling themselves from the kind of yoke of the Soviet past. Uh, and it felt really, um, it felt both funny and poignant. Um, and uh, 
indirect. And I guess that's one of the things that I was interested in. Um, this picture, on the other hand, I took very casually and I don't think I thought that there was anything um, very significant there, but I did, you know, I took a, a handful of pictures, 35 millimeter. Um, and it's only after the fact when I was editing and um, looking at contact sheets and, you know, printing and then editing that I realized that part of what was interesting was the kind of lack of ideological signifiers that were such a big part of the landscape that then were stripped away to, you know, look at, at this space that was empty from them. But also it's about the form of the picture. The exciting yeah. thing for me is the way in which the depth of the image shifts, the color, the kind of palette of, uh, of the photograph. And I guess in that there is also a kind of mystery that, um, you know, our vision is binocular. Uh, the camera sees things differently. So it's almost like the puzzle got slightly skewed and reoriented to mean something else. And that is always, again, this is, you know, this is not, um, a smart picture. Uh, it's, it's one that kind of exists outside of, I love the angle. That and, and a lot of it is about the angle color. Of that roof, that angle of that roof uh, takes you off balance a little bit. And uh, mm -hmm. it really plays with you. And uh, I actually, I, it makes sense why you would think that, you know, oh, maybe there's not something here. But then you look at it, it's, it's, it's quite interesting within the landscape of where you were and what you were doing. And uh, so, yeah, I'll let you continue. I apologize. No, not at all. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I was obsessed with these trees for some reason um, in um, sort of growing up, I would see this. And then it, I think it, I realized how bizarre it is to mm. see these very aggressively pruned trees that felt like severed limbs. And there was something yeah. evocative to me about that. So there was a number of pictures that I may, every time I would see them, I would felt like I had to photograph them. Um, it just felt like <laughs> your eye just kept going there. Yeah. Rudish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very practical reason why they do that too. So it's, it's really interesting. Um, um, yeah. And, and, and color really, it was, you know, how do you, um, this would probably be an okay black and white image. Um, but it's a, it's a really different kind of picture because of the different shades of blue that are kind of a part of it that speak directly to memory and the kind of um, reflections and the depth of reflections are then um, immersed with the, the color and, and its meaning. Um, so that's uh, on some level, it's as really as simple as me, like the project was for the most part guided by me trying to figure out how to make color pictures. Uh, and it, it was my, you know, it's the first time I was doing so. Um, this is a, this is more of a, a kind of photograph where I felt uh, like I was pointing at something. Um, I think I liked the idea of, well, I, I was attracted to the flatness of this building. Um, and again, through the camera, it looks differently, of course, but it's also the, the, this was in Mar taken in March. So the snow is starting to melt. There are these marks left on the buildings um, from the snow melting. And it felt almost like a kind of archeological uh, visualization that there's a way in which it spoke for me it it, it um, spoke to this idea of history and a kind of presence of history and these layers uh, that uh, was interesting um, and then i um, almost kind of was forced to start doing interior pictures after uh, a really unpleasant run-in with um, the Moscow cops who arrested me for taking pictures in a place that they thought was strange and suspicious. Um, and it was, it really scared me. And so there were days that I just felt really 
Like I, I had just had a hard time making myself kind of go out there and it was really cold. Um, and so I started to keep myself busy. I started reaching out to various people, inviting myself over. Um, this was a very kind of distant relative's house in Tambov, which is the city that my grandmother was from, that my mom was born in, where I traveled to for the first time. And so the, these houses were also vestiges of a past. Um, and all these objects were really recognizable to me. Um, my grandmother had a little statue just like that, the wallpaper, the um, lacy curtains, you know, the, the way in which people decorated their homes was so similar to each other because there were so few things that were manufactured. Um, so part of the idea that I, I, I mean, I think the thought that I had while shooting was that there was this uh, way in which ideology penetrated the in, the intimate space or the personal space. It was hard to really personalize something because of the way, you know, everyone had the same fridge. Everyone, there, there is a lack of variety, um, which meant that, you know, anytime you walk into someone's kitchen, it felt like your own memory, even if you were there for the first time. And that really stretched across the Soviet Union. So I spent some time in Uzbekistan, for instance, which is a, you know, totally different world, you know, language, religion, and so on. But there is still that bizarreness of walking into someone's apartment and feeling like it's, uh, you know, you've been there before. Um, so that it's was really fascinating. That was very interesting. And of course, that's totally yeah. gone. There was this moment where, you know, this this picture was taken in 2005. So 14 years after the Soviet Union fell apart. But it was still a time where people were um, slow to, you know, Ikea wasn't there. It was, you know, imports were not really coming in. So for the most part, people lived with the items that they acquired you know, in the seventies and eighties. Um, and they were, they were, um, still kind of a part of that, uh, visual world. So I, I know I mentioned the idea of a gift as, you know, that those are, those are the moments that make me feel like I could never abandon the practice of just walking around with a camera. So this was, uh, and, and, you know, it's a mystery. Um, <laughs> it's, a it's, a building in St. Petersburg. Um, and I remember it was a long day of shooting. I didn't find anything. And those days feel so terrible um, when you work so hard and you walk so many miles and you just don't, you know, you're not there at the right place at the right time. So this was kind of um, after many hours of that. And I could not tell where I was. I was momentarily totally disoriented because it was so convincing that I was looking at this mountainscape um, and it took me, you know, a second to realize that it was just this way that the paint or mold or, you know, something formed what looked like this beautiful scroll painting on this building. And so that I knew was special and it took me a second to figure out how to frame it in such a way that the kind of the trompe l'oeil effect of it being this deep space as opposed to a flat space could reveal itself slowly. So I wanted to um, include these little bits of windows at the top um, just as a kind of way of being returned back to this idea, you know, to the viewing point to figure out, you know, what is it that uh, is being looked at. Um, so that project ended in 2005, uh, and then I went to grad school, uh, and I did not choose to include any of those pictures because in many ways they were very transitional. Um, but it was not until after I graduated that I felt like I wanted to continue the work that I did prior, but in a different kind of way informed by um, the kind of new ideas that I had about picture making. So I do have a also, question though, about uh, sure. that last project. The remains was, uh, um, it, it's, it's really interesting. And 
um, it was one of the projects that really stood out to me. And I was curious why you, why you landed on the name Remains. Um, I mean, I think I would have titled it something else had I been yeah. doing this. Um, if it had a new name, what would you call it? I don't know. I wouldn't be able to come up with something <laughs> on the spot. Let's do it right I now. Guess it feels for the a show. Little, I guess it feels a little obvious maybe is what I would, well, I would yeah, say. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think that there's subtler, subtler things. I mean, at, again, at the time, and this was before I think I was um, as concerned about, you know, sounding smart. Um, I, it, it, it felt like it was, I was photographing what I what was still left over from the world that I left. Um, ah. That in many ways, it was the remains of my own um, version of my own childhood and its ties to this, uh, you know, the kind of slow dissolution of a world that was an ideological world. It was a physical world. It was a geographical world. So all of those things were part of it. Um, and I guess, you know, I don't want to use the word nostalgia. I feel like it's a, I don't know, it's a, it's a prickly word for me. Um, but, but there is certainly something that is elegiac about these pictures and their tone yeah. in their, the kind of flatness, the color palette, um, that felt like it was me collecting a kind of poem about, um, you know, a, a memory world. Yeah, it's, um, um, in, it came through, um, that, that one image at first I didn't realize it was a bus station. Uh, like I, I literally thought that that could have been some other place, but now that you're saying it's a bus station, it added a uh, context to it. And it seems like a random gathering of furniture. Like it could have been in someone's home, you know? And so, uh, yes, this one, it, that almost felt like that w it could have been in a, in a home, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, somebody's collection of things that they haven't really gotten mm -hmm. rid of. And so, um, it, it, you, you were speaking in metaphors, you were writing a visual poem here. And, and I, it, the, we, we like to say some titles are on the nose a little bit and it is a little on the nose, you know, but as far as the remains word, but I don't know that you could find another word for it because you were, um, in, in some ways, um, kind of identifying these things and, and, uh, discovering them again. And, uh, well, the remains of a, of a time that you remembered and, you know, you had a really fascinating observation about the availability of things and how that created copies within homes. They're all kind of the same, but I wanted to ask you a question where you said this ideology creeps in because all of them are all the same ideology. What did you mean by that? What are, what are you talking about there? What are you saying? Uh, well, I guess there was, a, you know, in some ways, in opposition to um, what I think is easy to take for granted in the United States, where, you know, the individual, um, mm. the kind of one's individuality as expressed through a number of, you know, visual choices, your home, your clothing, um, your vehicle, you know, all of that was um, it, it, you know, th this just, we, we don't question it. It's, 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 uh, it's an idea that is so ingrained in the kind of ch the idea of choice and, um, finding one's identity through those choices. I think this was largely absent in the Soviet Union. Of course, there were elites and people that had access to things that other people didn't. But for the most part, the idea that, you know, one defines themselves through the collective as opposed to the individual um, was very much, you know, uh, served up as a kind of truth and something to aspire to. That's fascinating. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, you would go to different people's houses and everything felt familiar. 
uh, I didn't think that was strange when I was living in it. I only realized how strange that was after I was gone for 10 plus years and then came back and realized, you know, this is what a, what a strange, um, way that, you know, people lived and continue to live. Um, it's so, a, it's a context that, um, um, it is, it is, it is an interesting, it's a, it's a mystery. <laughs> I'm going to go back to that word that I, I, I really quite enjoy it. It adds another level to it. Um, that, um, I think is quite fascinating because, you know, we, uh, you know, I am American and so we do take it for granted that that choice is a, is a way of kind of crafting your own identity and, but yet to find your identity in the collective is, um, is, uh, it's almost flipping that, uh, on its head, you know, and, and to get a look at it through your eyes is, is quite fascinating. So. Uh, I'll let you jump to your next project. <laughs> I was, I just had some questions yes. from that one for sure. Yeah, no, I don't know. Yeah. Let's see. Um, so I guess starting in 2009, I, after, after, um, finishing my MFA, um, I went back and I felt like I was really ready to think about what was the world of Russia um, at that time, as opposed to, um, doing this kind of looking backwards, uh, to the past. Uh, and it was interesting. And, um, I mean, even more interesting has been my way of looking at these pictures now after, um, well, the war in Ukraine started in 2014, but the full scale invasion in um, 2022, it really has allowed me to see something that was present in my photographs that I couldn't easily pinpoint. Um, and that has to do with the kind of militarism and um, kind of regressive politics of a place that were veiled pretty superficially by the kind of um, taste for opulence or the kind of like e the economic success of the Russia project under Putin was sort of a thin veiling for what continued to be, you know, a total um, crushing of any kind of real freedom. Um, and I found images that, again, I think intuitively I made um, and thought were important to make, but I didn't necessarily um, choose to print um, at the time. So this is one of them. And part of the reason why I wanted to start with this picture is that this is, you know, an image that says it all in some ways. Um, yesterday I had a conversation with a friend of mine about, you know, that kind of um, idealization of a picture that in one picture you can have all the ideas. And frequently I think, you know, it, photography is a serial medium, but once in a while there will be a photograph where there is a kind of condensation of thoughts. And I think this one is one of them. So it's, um, you know, representation in a very direct way of what, you know, can be referred to as the vertical of power, you know, in Putin's Russia. So there is the military, there is the kind of administrative bureaucracy in that figure of the middleman, there's the church, which is very much uh, in the service of the, um, you know, the dictatorship that is Russia. And then there's the propaganda um, as embodied by the camera. And not to say, again, that this means this and this means that, but it is um, a, a picture, you know, and of course there is the, the Russian flag as a background um, taken at, a, it's a graduation of from a military academy that in a, in a kind of eerie way, um, you know, talks about the extent to which the Soviet uh, apparatus continued to thrive 
um, but just with a new with a new skin. Um, so this is a picture that I think really has contains the seeds of the rest of it. Um, and then this image and both pictures um, were references to Man with a Movie Camera, it's a Gerberta film from 1929 that you know was made at the kind of dawning of the Soviet Empire. This was made at the maybe not dawning, but uh, still early phases of the Russian uh, Empire. Um, so the movie theater with a kind of audience there, you know, again, it's uh, formally, it's kind of a, you know, a striking picture because of the intensity of color, but really it's this idea of who is watching what, um, also a way of thinking about propaganda and the kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the almost brainwashing that could be read mm. into it. And, and again, I hesitate to give such concrete interpretations to my own pictures um, because I think there is part of, again, the photographs for me that work best are ones that can have so many different possibilities and reads. And this could be, you know, seen in a different way. But right now I'm narrating my own reinterpretation of my own pictures that have happened through um, this totally kind of critical paradigm shift um, yeah. that has been these last two years. There's a, uh, there's a attractiveness about that theater. It has a, uh, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's yeah, totally crazy. You, know, you want to go there and, but like what you're seeing in return is, it's interesting. Uh, it's it's a interesting context there for sure. Uh, the the col I mean, it's it, the cool thing is that it's um, the color is totally um, my film reacting to the light source. Uh, the building is actually silver. There's none of this blue exists. It was like a quite a monochromatic space but it's a long exposure and the um, video projection is what colored it in this kind of intense wild way. Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, I don't know whether in the screen share you could see, but there is a face underneath the um, cloth that's draped over it. And I think you really have to know your like the 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 diet of Soviet heroes to recognize it, but it's Yuri Gagarin who was the first man in space and a kind of national Soviet hero. Um, this was in a pavilion that was made um, in the '60s in Moscow, um, and it was kind of re redone to be a place where people were usually actually selling, uh, buying and selling things. Um, but then the much like the image of the Lenin in that bizarre bus station, um, you know, the, the face was covered up, but the object was not removed. And uh, that was one of the things that continued to interest me was ways in which even as spaces were repurposed to further the um, capitalist project as opposed to the Soviet project, there was still, you know, a way in which they continue, continued to loom uh, in the background. Um, so the there are some figures in this work, but um, frequently they're not, um, they're not as central as in, in my Ukraine work. Um, here, it's, I mean, I guess part of what I liked was the the looking up in this um, yearning way um, of what appears to be a young boy. Um, I think if you're looking at the print, it's pretty easy to, uh, you know, I, I, maybe not easy, but eventually you'll realize that it is not a living, breathing human, but a mannequin. And again, you know, with that backdrop of Vadenha, um, which is the 
Soviet exhibit, uh, the Center for Soviet Exhibition kind of achievements um, that was there along with the uh, bouncy castles and other things that came along in, um, you know, in the early 2000s. Um, this is this another, movie. yeah, this, this, this is, yeah. Yeah, this is one one of my favorites too. Yeah. Um, and another picture, maybe a kind of counter image to the vertical of power, um, because part of what you know I think seduced people into uh, you know not questioning you know the kinds of pernicious things that were happening for now decades under Putin was this idea of wealth and the promise of wealth and possibility. Um, so the fantasy of these things, the kind of progress and economic prosperity was something that, uh, you know, you hear Russians talk about still, you know, Putin brought us, you know, like we now can travel, we now can have a car, we can, um, afford things that we could never afford. So that illusion of progress, I think is in this picture, I guess one of the things that I was thinking about was represented in this ad of this Range Rover speeding into the future. And again, it's quite, I think it's quite convincing. And this is, this is the kind of picture I can never not take if I see something like this in, in you know, it's a different version of the landscape. Um, but it's, it, it's not until you see the weird horse, um, horse rider image that you start to kind of question one, your initial read of the image. Um, but all of that exists on one plane. And then on the other plane in the real world, there is this world of squalor, um, this, kind of faceless child, the homeless dog, the scattered pine cones, the um, tire, the unmounted tires, and so on. Uh, and so it's really the kind of collapsing of the reality and the fantasy into one space that feels like it is uh, another concise way for me to speak about the kind of much more complicated reality of, of Putin's world. Yeah. It's the tension in this is just palpable. And, uh, that's what really attracted me to it. I, I, I stopped on this one for sure. Uh, when I was looking at you, I got, I just got so lucky with the palette, you know, the, that yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah. It's the, the way in which the kids close, like it, there's only that interruption of the red of the yeah. car on the edge. Which is a like great was. contrast because yeah. that's what people Important. are driving. Critical that part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's interesting. It's uh, just a little bit of reality is dangled in there too, which is interesting. So um, I'll, I'll let you proceed. Um. Yeah, so I, the 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 certain um, yeah the kind of fet fetishization of um, the pageantry, I guess, the pageantry of these military parades. I mean, for most people who grew up in um, Soviet Russia, you know, you would look at this, and I guess the thing that gives it away as being maybe in the aughts as opposed to the 70s were the bigger billboards on the buildings, which are different than the Soviet style signs because they're photographic and the Soviet signs were primarily kind of hand painted. Um, but otherwise, like, and, and of course the camera, there's the kid with the camera and the idea of uh, the camera as this apparatus that looms large is something that I was kind of thinking about throughout, um, again, as a kind of reference to being watched, both surveillance and propaganda. But otherwise, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, display of military might through these young boys who are graduating from the military academy is something that was interesting to me. Um, and then also I was, I was trying to write about this picture. And I guess one of the things that I thought about was how it feels like a very silent image, even though there should be a kind of uh, 
loudness, but I think it's because the street is very clean and it's very empty and everything is sparse and it feels that much stranger to be kind of going through the motions of this kind of, um, uh, you know, imitation of, of um, a military parade that felt eerie to me. Like there's an eeriness to the image that I, I find interesting. And this is another one that I initially didn't print, um, but then discovered um, more recently. Yeah, there's a there's a strange silence about it, which is because you because a lot of times there's an audience that is watching this. Um, and mm -hmm. are you are they behind you in this photo? Is, well, there wasn't much of an audience. So um, that's what makes little... it interesting, too. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's. Uh, yeah. Wow. OK. Um, yeah. Now. Now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a quiet note for sure. Um, so this is, uh, this is, um, you know, the flip side, which is, it, you know, if going back to those Soviet interiors and how sparse, uh, and kind of, I guess, um, melancholic they are. And then this is the new interior. Um, and again, you know, Definitely, this is not representative of what an average Russian's house looked like. Um, this was someone uh, who was a classmate of mine. Um, it was her house, and you know, she made it. She married well, and you know, this was the kind of choices of what one can do with new the the, the new money funneled through you know gas and oil or or whatever, and the kind of cacophony of these things. Um, you know, the TV screen, the kind of French-like painting, the elephant oh, from oh, India, yeah. you know, the fabric of the couch that's meant to be, you know, English, the gold wallpaper, all of these things um, were, you know, very much spoke to this new visual language um, that was very much in step with this idea of wealth and display of wealth. Uh, and then this as a kind of counterpoint to, um, there was this period where, uh, and this wasn't just in Russia, I saw these in Ukraine and, um, um, and even, you know, in Central Asia, when I traveled there, there were these plastic trees that were um, imported. I'm not sure exactly where they came from, but at least in this particular scene, there was something very, um evocative about this snow covered place right it's you know bitterly cold and this kind of yearning for something um of the tropical that felt like such a uh incongruity to that kind of landscape it's, a, it's um, ir ironic for sure and, and it's uh the yellow just pops that's that sounds like it sounds like one of those other photographs you just can't not take. You're just like, yes. Yeah. No, um, this was a, this was a little this was a little easy. But, yeah. but also, you know, I think there is more to it if you think about it in the context of the other pictures, you know, if yeah, you're for sure. of looking at these two, this interior and this landscape and yeah. the kind of vast space between them and that they're also kind of the, the two sides of the coin that is that is uh, Russian existence. Um, and then this character was, uh, I mean, I met him in a park. He was, um, I think he was doing some kind of martial arts and it was part of it. I think I was like, wow, he really looks like young Putin. If you look at pictures of Putin as a young man, especially, you know, also doing martial arts, um, there was a, unquestionably a likeness there, but he moved in this very strange way. And so I asked him if we can, you know, set up a photo session and he agreed. It turned out to be totally disturbing and actually scary. He was this raving um, neo-Nazi uh, and, you know, had some really violent ideas about women. And so after I collected myself pretty quickly and, and got out of there with my stuff. But um, I think, you know, more to the point with the picture was the kind of rage that's there kind of 
pent up in his body in the kind of flexing and the blowing out of the air and in the immobilization like it is about this kind of emasculation that i think is part of the anger and the rage um the toxic rage that is fueling um you know the current conflict and the xenophobia and the racism like this idea of the empire as being something that could be taken from us um i think the seeds of all of that are in in a pic- this this picture um for wow. me um so you know and there is different kind like this is a more like an image that's trying to kind of rise above that and it was taken in 2011 so it's many years ago now i think it was a very different kind of time but in some ways it was about that kind of maximalism when it comes to decorating spaces of like filling the wall space with objects um and the kind of attempt to um beautify uh, a space uh and this almost horror film like hallway <laughs> these you know black walls that look like they're oozing something um that you know kubrick would have been excited about as, as well that 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 seemed to be appropriate in my way of um i guess describing uh, the psychological state of the Russian state um, through these kinds of interiors. Um, and this was another, I mean, maybe kind of version of the palm tree, um, but this was a really bizarre um, moment that was really exciting uh, to me and, and everyone else. I mean, everyone was making phone videos of this guy who I think was just really drunk and decided to send this excavator on an expedition across this pond and was using the, the digger to kind of swim across. And uh, it was, I mean, it's funny, but also there, there is something um, kind of pathetic about about this, uh, but it's also, you know, a kind of visual reference to a landscape and almost like a Poussin like French landscape, but instead of swans, it's this machine that is uh, being used in improper ways and, and so on. Uh, and then the last two of the Russia series are, is this um, Soviet era statue of young pioneers who are I photographed in this um, way where they almost appear to be blindly feeling their way through this emptiness. Um, and, uh, again, as a, as a way of speaking to the larger condition of, uh, the population. Um, and then one of the last images is this, uh, picture of a cemetery. Um, this is a grave digger, you know, uh, was in the process of lighting a cigarette as he was taking a break. Um, and again, a kind of anticipation uh, of the future violence that um, continues to be, you know, tragedy of disproportionate, <laughs> um, of a disproportionate size. Uh, I'm kind of curious. Uh, one of the things that I'm curious about is, you know, the, recent years that the, the war, um, that, uh, is going on there has kind of, you've referenced that a lot in your work. Uh, well, not well in your kind of interpretation now, uh, you're, as you were looking back at those images and taking us through that, ha, has that kind of, are, are you, do you plan on going back, um, to Russia to make new work or, or are you, are you kind of done for now? and hoping you can later. Uh, what's your thoughts on that now? Um, I'll just, uh, since it's the, the image it's is okay. not the, the, yeah. the appropriate image. Um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I'm terrified of that country. I feel like I have finally fully severed my connection to that place. Okay. Um, there is a part of me that would be really curious to see its total descent into 
core. Um, there is a part of me as an artist that I think would be curious to represent it and even to feel it, but I'm also a mother. I don't want to be thrown in jail. I, I mean, I, I'm a pretty brave person. I feel like I've taken a number of risks during my time as a photographer. This is not a risk I could ever feel like I could take. Um, I, I find it to be, I mean, the kind of crackdown on dissent or any kind of, I, I have friends who are making work and kind of amazing work there now in these horrible circumstances. But I guess as someone who really is not Russian, <laughs> yeah. but as an American um, who happens to have had this connection there, I just, I can't justify it. Um, so no, I, I mean, it's really, it is a total tragedy. I mean, I have a lot of my aunt and uncle live there. I have some cousins. Um, I have, you know, some friends, but uh, I um, am really, yeah, I think in some ways the threads the door has that been shut yeah. to, to yeah. tie me to that place, like there is, there's, it's all gone. Thank you.